Section 1. You will hear a conversation between a tax office employee and a woman who wants to apply for a tax number. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion, only the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. Tax office. How can I help you? I'd like to apply for a tax file number. Are you a citizen? No, but I'm told I still need a number. So what is your residency status? Are you a permanent migrant? Or perhaps a temporary visitor? Oh, I'm... I'm a permanent migrant. The applicant is a permanent migrant, so the letter C has been circled. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning, tax office. How can I help you? I'd like to apply for a tax file number. Are you a citizen? No, but I'm told I still need a number. So what is your residency status? Are you a permanent migrant or perhaps a temporary visitor? Oh, I'm... I'm a permanent migrant. And you need a TFN? A what? A TFN. It stands for Tax File Number. Yes. What is that exactly? It's a unique number we issue to individuals and organizations to help administer tax collection and other government systems. Why do I need one? In actual fact, you don't. What do you mean? It's not compulsory, you know. But I should get one? Well, it's a good idea. Otherwise, you'll have more tax withheld from your wages or salary. In fact, you won't be eligible to participate in the PAYE, that's pay-as-you-earn system, and you couldn't apply for income support or other benefits. You wouldn't have to pay the Medicare levy, but then you wouldn't be entitled to claim Medicare benefits either. I'd better have one then. Okay. So you're currently living in this country, right? Yes. What kind of visa do you have? A working visa? Well, I did have one, because after my student visa expired, I went back home and worked for a year before applying for a job here. The job turned out to be permanent and full-time, and my employers wanted me to settle here. So now I have a permanent migrant visa. Now, once you have a file number, you never need to reapply. Even if your circumstances change, for example, if you get married or decide to take an English name, they'll even use the same one when you retire and apply for a government pension. I see. Have you ever had a TFN before? No. Right. Let's get on with the application process now. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. What is your passport or travel document number? Oh, just a moment. I have it here. JGW11005365. Where do you come from? I came from Greece. Is that your country of origin? Yes, I came from Greece. Are you Greek? Do you have a Greek passport? No, I was born in Spain. I have a Spanish passport but I've been living in Greece. And where do you live now? 
Where will the department send your TFN? That's one three three nine Harbor Drive, Hollywell. Postcode one five one seven. Thank you. Now, what's the best way to get in touch with you? By phone, you can ring my landline number zero nine five five seven seven five zero seven six. I'm sorry, I haven't got a cell phone at the moment. I see. Can you give me the details of someone else we could contact if we can't get you during office hours? That would be my landlady. What's her name? Martha Pierce. Is that Pierce? P I E R C E. No, it's P E A R C E. And her number is the same as the one I gave you. Yes, I've got that. Now, for some more personal details, what title do you use? Excuse me. Are you Mrs., Miss, or Ms.? I'm not married. Put me down as Miss. All right. What's your surname? Farina. What's your first name? Maria. Do you have a second or middle name? Well, two actually. What are they? Rosa Anna. I'm guessing Farina is your maiden name since you haven't been married. But are you known by any other names? Farina is my only surname, but people call me Mary. As a first name? Yes. When were you born, Mary? Can you give it to me in the following order: day, month, and year? The fifteenth of November, nineteen eighty-three. You're obviously female, so that brings me to the last question, which I don't really need to ask. What's that? Your husband's name. I don't have one. I know, so I'll just write down N A for not applicable. Thank you. That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section two. Section two. You will hear a talk about keeping children safe on the internet. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Listen carefully and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Thank you for coming. It's good to see so many of you interested in keeping your children safe on the internet. What's in store? Well, firstly, I'm going to talk in general about some common sense ideas and rules for young ones using the computer. Then, I'll give you some information on free educational websites. Finally, we'll finish with question time. I'm sure most of you think that the internet can be a frightening place in which to let your children roam loose, but let me remind you that it can also be a fountain of knowledge and education. The trick is to avoid the former and utilize the latter. There are programs available both in your local electronics supply shop and free to download that will keep your child safe to a certain degree on the World Wide Web. A popular one is Online Family Norris, which bars things like military and social websites. I wouldn't advise you to rely solely on a program to protect your family, though. As good as it is. You cannot abdicate your responsibility as a parent. I'm sure you all know that, or you wouldn't be here. When all is said and done, the the best way to keep children safe is to educate them and keep an eye on them. 
For this reason, you should make sure the computer which your child uses is kept in a communal space, where you can look over their shoulder from time to time. It is paramount that you teach them never to divulge their proper or full name, and to never provide personal information such as where they live or what their phone number is. Tell them that online friends must remain just that. Online, unless they are supervised. It is difficult, I know, to teach children about the dangers of the world when they are so naive, so trusting, and innocent. But without going into great detail, you must alert them to the possibility that the people they are chatting with may not be who they say they are. It's also sensible not to give them their own email address until they are old enough to use the internet safely. So all communication from websites will go through you. When they are old enough to use social sites like Facebook and MySpace, teenagers need to know that whatever postings they put on the web will remain accessible forever. Nothing is ever really deleted there, and embarrassing pictures or remarks may come back to haunt them one day. For instance, when they apply for a job, they could jeopardize their chances, as the employer or human resources staff will look on the web to find out more about their potential employee, and they may be shocked by what they find there. Not the sort of stuff an applicant would want on his or her CV. It can also make them more vulnerable to bullying. Unfortunately, bullying on social sites is another thing to look out for, and I have to tell you, it's on the increase. It's a very difficult issue to deal with, but something that is more easily detected if the computer is kept in a family space. If we can put these negative issues aside, let's not forget that the internet is also a wonderful place for children of all ages. Teenagers may be mostly networking on social sites or completing research that they've been asked to do as part of their homework assignments, but younger children can get assistance with mathematics, spelling, and reading on a variety of free. And paid for sites. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions seventeen to twenty. Now listen and answer questions seventeen to twenty. A good way for children to learn and have fun at the same time is the website MathTutor dot com. They can practice mathematics on this site, no matter what their level, while they compete against other children from all over the world. And here's a fun way for primary school children. To learn the spelling words for the week, it can be such a chore for some children. They just type them in and play games to learn them. What's that? The website? Oh, sorry. Yes, you'll need to go to spellcity dot com for that. The one I'm going to tell you about now is one of the most practical sites that's popular with people of all ages. Children. Or parents, for that matter, can learn to touch type as they sing along with songs, and there's a variety of funny characters to help you enjoy yourself as you learn. In this day and age, typing is essential. Everyone should be able to type fast and accurately. So, go to beeb. dot co forward slash typing and try it out. Don't just leave it up to the kids. Here's a site that parents can use to download worksheets to extend their children by giving them further practice. It's called 
coolresources.com. And I can really recommend it, particularly for middle school students. Now, are there any questions? That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section three. Section three. You will hear a conversation between two students in the education department who are discussing their first assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-eight. Listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-eight. Hey, Ted, what are we going to do about this assignment? Well, Cleo, I think it's pretty straightforward. Oh. Yeah, the topic is why study abroad. I suggest we do a survey of international students, collate the responses, make a graph, and exhibit our findings in the form of a poster. Wow, you have given this some thought, haven't you? Of course, this is only the first assignment. There will be a lot more to come, so let's get this one out of the way quickly. Well, how do we do the survey? I think we need to find a good selection of foreign students. So, how about we go over to the English language school at lunchtime and talk to some of the students there? That's not a bad idea, but we shouldn't limit ourselves to that department. Why not? Well, think about it. They'll all give the same reason: to learn English. Of course, you're right. Well, one of us could cover the language school, and the other could go around the business school. Yes, I know there are a lot of internationals there too. But I think a random sample from foreign students on campus might give us a better range of answers. Hmm. What are we going to ask them? Why are you studying abroad? An open question like that could mean we get hundreds of different responses. It would be better if we made up, say, ten reasons and asked each respondent to place them in order of importance. You're right. That would certainly make collation easier. Any ideas about what these ten reasons might be? Sure, I've got enough foreign friends to know quite a lot about what motivates them. Okay, number one is. I think that's obvious. How about study abroad is the best way to learn a language, and number two is obvious as well. I know, study abroad gives you the chance to travel. What's third? It's either culture or friendship. Okay, let's go for culture. Study abroad gives you first-hand experience of a different culture. Not just that, but it gives you new experiences as well. Not all of them are good, but it's meeting those challenges and adapting to new situations and solving problems and so on. Let's make that a separate reason. How about study abroad? Um. Will compel you to develop new skills. Sounds good. Then study abroad promotes international friendship. What are we up to now? Um, wait. That was number five. Do you think learning about yourself is the same as developing new skills? No, I think it's quite different. Probably more closely related to culture. You really mean embracing new concepts and perceptions, don't you? Yes. And reconsidering one's own beliefs and values, or at least seeing them through new eyes. We could make the next one and call it something like, "Study abroad provides the opportunity to learn about yourself." 
We ought to throw in a few about study and work, because I'm sure that rates highly with many foreign students. Of course, study abroad gives you the opportunity to expand your academic um. Academic what? Let's simplify it. Make it the opportunity to study different subjects. Yes, good. It can also enhance the value of your degree. How's that? Well, I think you can take courses you would never have had the opportunity to take on your home campus, and employers will know also that your language skills have been given quite a boost. Isn't that the same as number seven? No, I think it's a separate issue. All right, keep it. Now I think this next one is more important. Shall I change the order? No, no need. The students are going to rank them according to their views. So what is it? Study abroad enhances employment opportunities. Ugh! Why didn't I think of that? Anyway, there's one even more obvious than that. Let me guess. Study abroad broadens your mind. Exactly. Okay. Now we have ten. Let's print off one hundred questionnaires and go and do the survey. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions twenty-nine to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-nine to thirty. Did you hear about the National Geographic survey of American students between the ages of eighteen and twenty-four? Yes, it sounds as if they could benefit from study abroad. Did you know that only one percent of U.S. students currently study abroad? Anyway, back to that National Geographic survey. It was carried out internationally, and it was Sweden that came out on top. It's really amazing, isn't it? When given a map of the world, only thirteen percent of American students were able to find Iraq, and the same for Iran. I know, and not surprisingly, I suppose Afghanistan didn't fare much better. Eighty-three percent couldn't locate it on the map. There must be something about that region. Seventy-six percent couldn't identify Saudi Arabia either. But Asia didn't come off much better. Over half the students couldn't find Japan on the map. But do you know what's really incredible? Yes, I do. Eleven percent of them couldn't even find their own country. It's no wonder the USA scored near the bottom, only two points above Mexico, which was ranked last. That is the end of section three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section four. Section four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the art history department. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. In this lecture today, I'm going to introduce you to an American painter, Charles Wilson Peale. You may be familiar with his portraits, but did you know that he never even saw a painting till he was a grown man? He was born in Maryland in 1741. 
His father died when he was nine, and the family struggled financially for the next few years, and Charles became a saddle-maker's apprentice. One day, he went to Norfolk for supplies, and there he saw paintings for the first time. He thought they were so bad that he felt sure he could do better, so he decided to make painting his career. In 1766, he went to London to study painting with Benjamin West. Whilst there, he painted this portrait in 1768, see slide 1, Pitt as a Roman senator. Notice how elaborately symbolical this portrait is. The symbolism arises, of course, from Pitt's famous speech to the British Parliament, where he draws an analogy between the ancient Roman Senate's view of a barbaric Britain and the prevailing European view of the time of a barbaric African continent fueling the slavery trade. Perhaps you didn't know that the Romans used Britons as slaves. But I digress. Back to Peel. He returned to America and in 1772 painted the first ever portrait of George Washington. See slide 2. In 1773, he painted a group portrait of himself, his wife, mother, brothers, sister, his old nurse, and an unidentified baby. Just look at the slide. This painting is simply called The Peel Family. And you can almost feel the exuberance of the family and their warmth towards one another. He enjoyed great success as a portraitist prior to the Revolution and served with distinction in the Revolution. During this time, he became friends with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. After the war, he continued to paint, and, when his wife died in the 1790s, as a result of her eleventh pregnancy, he remarried. He had seventeen children in all, naming the sons after famous painters or scientists. Although perhaps best known for his portraits of famous people, Peel liked novelty. Look at this slide of his two sons, Raphael and Titian, life-size, climbing a narrow stairway. This painting, The Staircase Group, 1795, was exhibited in a doorway as a trompe l'oeil, and it is said that it did, in fact, fool the eye of George Washington. Even as far back as 1772, we can see his desire for difference in Rachel weeping. It's a rather macabre portrait of his first wife crying over the death of one of their children, their daughter Margaret. I'd like to show you one more slide to demonstrate his innovative approach. This is a portrait of his brother, James, sitting at his desk at night, with only his face illuminated by a lamp. This was painted much later than the others, in 1822. You know, Peel believed anyone could learn to paint, and he taught painting to his brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and other relatives. Four of his sons, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Raphael, became painters, as did his brother James. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Peel. He was active in politics for several years, and throughout his life he maintained a lively interest in many branches of science. He was also an inventor who gained patents for a fireplace, porcelain false teeth, and a new kind of wooden bridge. He collaborated with Thomas Jefferson on what was known as the polygraph, a kind of portable writing desk. But it wasn't any ordinary desk. This one could make several copies of a manuscript at once. He also wrote papers on a wide variety of subjects, from hygiene to engineering. Oh, and he also tried his hand at inventing a fairly primitive but innovative motion picture technique, new types of eyeglasses, and a velocipede, which is a precursor to the bicycle. Now, some of the original velocipedes had pedals and some didn't. You sort of scooted along on them using your feet. 
Unfortunately, I can't remember which type it was that Peel worked on. He's also remembered for his work as a naturalist. He established the first scientific museum in America, and he even invented his own system of taxidermy. For those of you who aren't sure what taxidermy is, it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and presenting dead animals so that they appear lifelike. He was also well ahead of his time in that he placed his animals in a simulated natural environment. His most magnificent exhibit, however, was the complete skeleton of an extinct mammal known as a mastodon, which he helped excavate. The event was memorialized in his extraordinary painting, The Exhuming of the Mastodon. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have ten minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.